So this is pretty nice. Uh, we're able to set up some definitions of what it means to take the dot product or wedge product between vector and bivector computationally. But we're also interested in what the meaning of the dot and wedge product between vector and bivector is. After all, we already have some geometric understanding of what dot and wedge product mean between two vectors. The dot product between two vectors had something to do with projecting one vector onto another, whereas the wedge product had to do with extending one vector along another vector. And to further explore the geometric meaning of the dot and wedge products in the vector by vector sense, I'd like to review a few important concepts that we've learned about with vector vector products. So let's suppose we had two vectors which are in the same direction. Let's say that first vector is u and this one is v. So what this means is that u wedge v goes to zero. This part of the geometric product disappears, leaving us with the dot product part. The dot product part commutes. So what that means is that when u is parallel to v, that means that uv is equal to vu, that the geometric product commutes. And it also means that the geometric product uv is equal to the dot product. So that's the case when u and v are in the same direction, when they're parallel. We also had the case when they're orthogonal. Let's say we have this vector be u, and let's have that orthogonal vector be v. So what this meant was that u dot v is equal to zero. The dot product part disappears, leaving only the wedge product part. So we can say the geometric product uv is equal to the wedge product. And this wedge product is anti-commutative when it's between two vectors. So what that means is that uv is equal to minus vu. So when two vectors are orthogonal, the geometric product anti-commutes. So this is when u is orthogonal to v. And in general, I emphasize it's neither of these two cases. The geometric product is neither commutative or anti-commutative. These are just special cases. So to explore the geometric meaning in this case between vector and bivector, I'm going to draw a little inspiration from what we've already discovered. So instead of u being parallel to v in this case over here, I'd like to look at the special case where a is in the plane of b. I'm going to denote that by these, this symbol here, that a is called planar to b. That is, if I have some bivector like this that defines a plane, there's b. I'd like to consider that special case where a is right in the plane of b. And we're going to see what happens to the geometric product in that case. And then I'm going to draw some inspiration from this, where u is orthogonal to v. So in that case, if I have my plane defined by the bivector, I'd like to consider that other special case where a is orthogonal to this plane. So I'm going to denote that as a is perpendicular to b. And we're also going to see what's going to happen with this geometric product in this case as well. So let's deal with that first case where a is in a plane of b. And I'm going to take the same strategy. We're going to deal with a couple examples, and then we're going to ascend to the general case. So the bivector I'd like to pick is this one. B is equal to E2, E3, or equivalently E2 wedge E3. So the diagram here, it's going to be this bivector. And the orientation is that. So that's B. And now, what are some very simple vectors that we know are in the plane of this bivector b. Well, a really simple example is e2. So let's see what happens when we multiply a b, that is e2 times e2 e3. So that's equal to a b. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to swap the order here. So I'm going to write e3 e2 but I've got to stick in a minus sign. And just to make what happened here clear, I'm going to draw some parentheses around here. But check out what happened. I have e2 times e2 e3. Then here I have the reversed order, e2 times e2 e3. But I've got a minus sign there. So this is actually equal to minus ba in this example. So when I multiply e2 times the by vector b, that's equal to minus b times that vector a, or e2 in that case. So that's one example. I find that 
E2 anti-commutes with E2, E3. But what happens if we instead let A be equal to E3? We know E3 is certainly in this plane, so let's see what happens. So we have E3 times the bivector, E2, E3. That's equal to AB. And again, let me swap the order of these two. So I can write minus E2, E3, E3. And again, let me just draw some parentheses just to make that clear. And again, notice what happened. Here we have E3 times the bivector, whereas here we have minus the bivector times E3. So it's again equal to minus BA. So hopefully that seems pretty simple. We now know that both E2 and E3 will anti-commute with the bivector E2, E3. But these two facts are actually sufficient to show that any linear combination of E2 and E3 producing an, yet another vector in this plane will also anti-commute with B. And let me show you why that is. So we're going to consider any linear combination of E2 and of E3. I'm going to write this as alpha times E2 plus beta times E3, where alpha and beta are just some scalars. So we're going to consider the product between this linear combination. And on a diagram, this might look something like this. So some linear combination, let's say that one, of E2 plus another scalar multiple of E3. And the vector sum might look something like this. So this might be my arbitrary vector here. So I'm going to multiply this vector by E2, E3. And I'm going to play the same game. I'm going to do a little shuffling here. So I'm going to distribute first alpha times E2, E2, E3. Then I have plus beta E3, E2, E3. And I just shuffle some stuff around. I'm going to swap these two. So it's going to stick in a minus sign. Alpha, E2, E3, E2. And then I'm going to shuffle these two around. So it's going to be minus beta E2, E3, E3. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to yank out minus E2, E3 on the left. Because I have that here. Minus E2, E3, minus E2, E3. So I have minus E2, E3. And what I'm left with is plus alpha E2 plus beta times E3. Which notice, that is indeed the anti-commuted version of what we started with. So that proves that any linear combination of E2 and of E3 will also anti-commute with E2, E3. So let's summarize our finding in our example. We found that when A is in the plane of B, that implies that the geometric product anti-commutes, that AB is equal to minus BA. And notice this is actually the opposite of what happens with the geometric product between two vectors when they're parallel. So that's another important distinction to keep in mind. So we saw that in one particular example, but now let's prove that in general. That in general, when you have a vector, which is in the same plane as the bivector, that the geometric product between the two anti-commutes. And here's how we're going to do that. We're going to consider some arbitrary bivector, which is going to be formed by the wedging of two vectors, let's say u and a v. So this is going to be my totally arbitrary bivector. Let's give it some orientation. So that's B. So B is going to be formed by wedging U and V together. And then I'm going to play a very similar game. I'm going to take two vectors, which I know are already in the plane, namely U and V. I'm going to prove that those anti-commute with U wedge V. And then I'm going to show that any linear combination of U and V will also anti-commute with B. So let's show that first claim. Let's first multiply U times U wedge V. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write out the definition of this wedge product between two vectors in terms of the geometric product. Remember what that was? It's 1 half UV minus VU. Notice that when it was between vectors, we have that minus sign there. And then distribute the U in. So I have 1 half u squared v minus u v u. And now, one thing I can do with this u squared, remember that when I take a vector and square it, that gives me a scalar. I can commute that around. I can just 
move the scalar around. So it's going to be equal to v times u squared, which I'll write as u u minus u v u. And then what I do is I factor out a u on the right. So I'm going to write this as one half v u minus u v all times u. And then I'm going to write this one half v u minus u v back as a wedge product. So that's equal, that's equal to v wedge u times u. And remember that when I have the wedging of two vectors, I can actually flip those around. Here I've got to stick in a minus sign. So that's actually equal to u wedge v times u. And notice that when I commute these two, I've got to stick in a minus sign, which is what I was looking to show. Now I'm going to play the same game with v. I'm going to multiply v times u wedge v. And again, I'm going to write this wedge product in terms of a geometric product. So I have v times 1 half uv minus vu. I distribute the v in there. So I have 1 half v uv minus v squared u. Again, I'm going to flop that scalar around because remember, v squared is also a scalar. So I have 1 half v uv minus u v v. And I play the same game, I factor out the v on the right now. So I have 1 half v u minus u v times v. And I notice that 1 half v u minus u v can be written as v wedge u times v. And again, I flop these around. Now I've got to stick in a minus sign, so it's minus u wedge v times v. So look what happened. v times u wedge v is equal to minus u wedge v times v. So I have the anti-commutative property here too. And then the last thing that I can show very easily is that any linear combination of u and v, let's say alpha times u plus beta times v times the wedge product, which I'll just write as big B. I'm looking to show anti-commutative here too. So I distribute, I have a uh, alpha times u b plus beta v b. And I already know that these two can be flopped. That was proven over here. So I have minus alpha b u. And also over here, v times b. I prove over here, those can be flopped around. Just taking in a minus sign. So beta b v. And now I'm going to yank out a minus b on the left. And what I'm left with is alpha u plus beta v. So here I've shown in general that any linear combination of u and v, that is any other vector that's in the plane that could look like that, for example, will anti-commute with b. So here I've got my finding that when a is in the plane of b, that the geometric part between a and b is anti-commutative. So now let's consider the case where A is totally out of the plane of B. That is, it's orthogonal to the plane. And you can probably guess what's going to happen. That's going to be commutative, but let's actually go through the examples and show that. And again, I'd like to consider a special example first. And this example is going to be, let's let the bi vector be E1, E2. So on a diagram, that'll be that bi vector. There's B. And an easy vector that's totally out of plane, that's, it's orthogonal to the plane, is just E3. So I'm going to let my vector A be E3. And let's just multiply. Let's consider A times B. So it's going to be E3 times E1, E2. It's equal to AB. Now I'll draw some parentheses just for clarity. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to swap E3. I'm going to shuffle it two places to the right. I'm going to move it here once. That's one minus sign here. That's two minus signs. So when I reorder that, that's equal to plus E1, E2, E3. And let me draw some parentheses around E1, E2 for clarity. And notice that's equal to BA, just as we predicted. We've seen what happens in our simple example. Now let's prove this in general, that when A is orthogonal to the plane defined by the bi vector B, that the geometric product 
AB is commutative, that AB is equal to BA. And again, I'm going to consider some arbitrary bivector formed by the wedging of two vectors. Let's say I have U and V. And the bivector that gets created is this one. Let's take the orientation on there. That's B. So again, B is U wedge V. And now what I'm going to do is consider some other arbitrary vector, which is orthogonal to the plane. Let's let me call this W. And again, that's totally orthogonal to this plane here. And again, you got to think of this in three dimensions. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply W, the vector, times the wedge product, U wedge V. And again, what I'm going to do is we're going to expand this wedge product in terms of the geometric product of two vectors. So it's one half UV minus VU. And once again, I distribute one half W UV minus W VU. And now recall that when I have a vector, two, two vectors which are orthogonal, let's say W and U, W and U are orthogonal here, that under the geometric product, they will anti-commute. You've got to stick in a minus sign when you swap positions. So W is orthogonal to U, W is also orthogonal to V. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to shuffle W two places to the right here. So you've got to put in two minus signs or just a plus sign. But this is equal to one half U, V, W, just pushing W two places to the right. And I do the same trick here. If you guys stick in two minus signs, which doesn't change the sign, so this is equal to V, U, W. And what I can now do is factor out W on the right. So I have one half U, V minus V, U times W, which is U wedge V times W, which is what I aim to show, that when W is orthogonal to the plane of this bi vector, U wedge V, that it commutes. So let's see if those two theorems provide any further insight to what's going on with the dot product and wedge product between vector and bi vector. So remember that we said that when A is coplanar with B, that implies that AB is equal to minus BA. Now we could just do a little rearranging here. We'll move this onto the left-hand side. So we have AB plus BA is equal to zero. Now if AB plus BA is equal to zero, that certainly means that one half of that is also equal to zero. But remember what this is. One half AB plus BA was the wedge product between A and B. So when A is coplanar to B, that implies that the wedge product between A and B is zero, which let's try to make sense of this in, in a picture. Let's say this is my bi vector here. Let's say that's B. Let's say A is in the plane. So A might look like that. So remember what this wedge product is. We're trying to take some bi vector in this case, and we're trying to extend it along A to form a volume element. But notice here, there's no volume that gets extended here because A is totally in the plane of B. There's nowhere to go. There's no volume swept out. So hopefully that kind of makes sense, what's going on there. And now let's play around with this other case where A is orthogonal to the plane. So here's a picture that we're trying to think of here. Here's the bivector B, or that I should say the plane defined by the bivector B. And we have a, a vector which is totally orthogonal. So again, we can do a little rearranging. We can move this to the left-hand side and say that AB minus BA is equal to zero. And again, if this is equal to zero, then certainly one half of this is equal to zero. And what is one half AB minus BA? Well, this is that dot product. So A dot B is equal to zero if A is orthogonal to the plane. And notice that even though this might seem a little bit weird that we have the minus sign here, this makes sense just like it did with vectors. Remember, when two vectors are orthogonal, they dot to zero. In this case, a vector dotted with a bi vector, when the vector is orthogonal to the plane, also dots to zero. So we see this conceptual unification in the dot product. We've been dealing with a lot of special cases, but now let's try to synthesize everything. So let's consider some arbitrary bi vector b and define some plane, which I've denoted here. 
and some arbitrary vector a, which is neither totally in the plane nor is it totally orthogonal to the plane. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to think of a as having a part in the plane and having a part which is orthogonal to the plane. Put another way, I'm going to project a onto the plane, forming this vector here, which I'm going to call a parallel, which is in the plane, and the part which is orthogonal to the plane, which I'm going to call a perp. So that vector is orthogonal. So I have a, which is going to be written as the vector sum of a parallel plus a perp. And now let me ask the question, what is a dot b? So what is a dot b? Now I'm going to use this inside here, that a can be written as a parallel plus a perp. I'm going to substitute that right here. So I have that that's equal to a parallel plus a perp dot b. And it's actually a simple little proof to show that this is actually distributive. This dot product is actually distributive as you, as you would expect. So this is equal to a parallel dot b plus a perp dot b. Now check this out. We have a perp dot b. A perp, remember that was orthogonal to the plane. So that goes to zero as we found before, leaving only a parallel dot b. But I claim that a parallel dot b is equal to the geometric product between a parallel and b. Why is that? Because remember we were saying that the geometric product between the vector and bivector now has a dot product part and a wedge product part. But the wedge product part of a parallel and b, since a parallel is in the plane, that disappears, leaving only the dot product part. So that's why this is equal to that. So our conclusion is that a dot b is equal to a parallel times b. Now, if I have a vector, namely a parallel, and it's in the plane of this bivector, what does it mean to take the geometric product of this vector and this bivector? Well, remember what that means in general when you take the geometric product with the bivector. What it's going to do is it's going to rotate a parallel 90 degrees according to the orientation of B. In this case, it's multiplying on the right. So it's going to rotate a parallel 90 degrees in the plane and it's going to stretch or dilate it according to how much area is swept out in B. So for example, I might shrink it like that. So this vector, which is also in the plane of B, is the vector A dot B, which is equal to the geometric product A parallel times B. And these two are orthogonal. So we can see that what it means to take the dot product between a vector and a bivector is to first project the vector onto the plane, then rotate it 90 degrees, and then either stretch or shrink it according to however much area is in B. Hopefully we're developing some geometric intuition about what it means to take the dot product between vector and bivector in terms of first projecting that vector onto the plane, and then swinging it around 90 degrees, and then either stretching it or contracting it, depending on how much area is in B. Let's try to understand what it means to take the wedge product between A and B. So let's play the same game. Let's substitute in for A, A parallel plus A perp, and wedge that with B. And again, we're going to distribute, and I'll leave that as an exercise for you to show that you can actually distribute. And now let's check this out. We have A parallel wedged with B. So A parallel wedged with the by vector. So when we extend that into a volume, we get zero volume as we've thought about before. So that's the term that disappears here. And what we're left with is that A wedge B is equal to A perp wedged with B. So what does this mean? Now thinking in terms of this extension with the wedge product here, what it means to take A and wedge it with B is to consider only the part which is completely orthogonal to the plane, take that by vector and extend it along that orthogonal vector into an oriented volume element. And I won't draw that into the picture because that'll make it kind of messy. But if you can, you can imagine this area, this oriented area being extended upward along this orthogonal vector to the plane. And like we did over here, writing the dot product as a geometric product, we can also notice that this wedge product here can also be written as the geometric product between a perp and b for very similar reasons as here. 
Here, we decompose this geometric product into a dot product part and a wedge product part. The dot product part goes to zero because A perp is orthogonal to B, leaving only the wedge product part. So we can finally make this statement that A wedge B is equal to A perp times B, which is equal to A perp wedge B. So hopefully we're developing a picture now of what it means to take some arbitrary vector and either dot it or wedge it with a by vector. And when you combine those two, you get the geometric product. So when you think of the dot product part, think of projecting it first onto that by vector, then swinging it around 90 degrees, either stretching it or contracting it. That's going to form the vector part of the geometric product AB. And then the wedge product part, the tri-vector part, is going to be taking that by vector B and extending it along the orthogonal part of A or A perp. And of course, you have the two special cases where A is completely out of the plane, where A is orthogonal to B, in which case the vector part goes to zero. And you can now see that geometrically because the projected part onto the plane is the zero vector. So the vector part goes away, leaving only tri-vector part. And then we have that other special case where A is totally in the plane of B. So the projected part of A is just A itself that gives a vector part only and then the tri-vector part goes to zero because when B gets extended, that forms zero volume. So if you can grasp this geometric picture of the sum of the dot product part and of the wedge product part, then that's basically what I wanted you to get out of this video. So that'll wrap it up for this video. I think we've covered quite a bit of ground here. We've extended our concept of the dot and wedge product to include dot and wedge products between vectors and by vectors. And we also made the important observation that when we take the geometric product, that can also be split into the dot product part and a wedge product part. And like I said, if you can grasp what's going on in this geometric picture here, you've pretty much got it. So I uh, thank you for watching. And if you like the content, feel free to subscribe and leave your angry comments below.